So this is the self development with tactics. Book. So today we're once again going to talk about how to be a billionaire, which basically is a book about billionaires and how they were able to become billionaires, which at my point of view, and I've, and I've been talking about it before, but at my point of view, this is something that's incredibly interesting when it is indeed some sort of a examination of uh, all kinds of people and to just see what qualities they're having, what they have done, what just makes the difference and all of those things. And uh, yeah, so let's actually talk about that and let's actually go through that and I'm gonna read. But beforehand, I do want to point out something. There is a guy and uh, he's a graphic designer and he's from Berlin or he is based in Berlin. I don't know if he's from Berlin or not. Um, he has 70. Okay, so he's not just uh, a small person on Instagram. And I just texted him being like, well, you know, just, you know, could you give me some tips on how I can get better with my design? Because I do struggle a bit from time to time and I do just want to get better so that I can also do better work for my clients. And he replied, you know, just in like half an hour or something or in an hour. And he was like, yeah, you know, you just have to read quite a lot, you know, go to your public library and just go through every single fucking book you can find there. And I was amazed. I was amazed because I didn't really expect that I actually get a reply and I didn't expect that I'm going to get a reply so fucking fast and um super nice guy as well like really super nice like just tremendously um tremendously nice and and i don't know like just it's amazing you know i'm just really gonna try to uh push him in uh one or the other way um yeah i don't know like i'm just definitely gonna post something into my story on instagram uh it's amazing you know and i do really want to support those people that are su super fucking nice and I'm being like, well, yeah, okay, that, that's, you know, I've been like, well, you know, have a nice day. Thank you very much once again. He was like, yeah, f of course. And just have a nice day as well. And it's amazing. You know, it just uh, sometimes amazes me how nice some people can be or how many nice people they actually are, you know, because I do think that sometimes we um, tend to forget about that. Maybe. Um, but yeah. Uh Autor Ganesing, the competition, in contrast, is one proven method of breaking away from the pack, which is one of the most important things that I have seen. Because if you're doing whatever the competition is doing, then yeah, why would somebody go to you? If you're just doing the exact same fucking thing, then it is probably going to boil down to who is the cheapest one. And this is probably not always going to be you. The opportunity arises precisely because of certain melodies that give the word organization a negative connotation. Companies that exhibit the following sorts of behavior become sitting ducks for rivals that can respond quickly and effectively to an evolving competitive environment. Long lines of communication keep senior management unaware of changes in the marketplace. Fear of rocking the boat discourages employees from coming forward with worthwhile ideas. Primary focus on avoiding mistakes that us managers from taking risks. And the last one is obsession with defending turf diverts or diverts managers from capitalizing on business opportunities. I do just want to point out that it's fucking important to not be like the competition. Whatever you do, don't be the competition. It doesn't make actually that much sense. What makes the self-made billionaire's knack for building effective companies distinctive has little to do with the formal elements such as organizational charts and performance measurement. It is more a matter of giving their organization the stamp of their invariable strong personalities. Most self-made billionaires have preferred to focus on more lucrative activities. By swinging more deals and overcoming the leveling effect of competition, they have become far wealthier than managers who are much more adept at handling their details. So most self-made billionaires have preferred to focus on more lucrative activities by swinging more deals and overcoming the leveling, which means, as I'm just reading it rightly, um, doing more things, not focusing necessarily on one particular thing and trying to just get the best at it, which I can in some other way also suggest and also recommend because if you indeed are trying to get the best at a very specific thing and a very just a minor thing maybe as well, then then yeah, you know, you might get the best or you might become the best, not necessarily um, but also, I think that we all just don't do one thing. 
You know, we all like several things, you know, there's no fucking person that only likes this one thing, you know, when it is about like, okay, I just really tremendously love reading. Yeah, okay, you love reading, but you're probably not going to read the same book all the time, and you're probably not going to read the same genre all the time, and you're probably not going to read the book or books by the same author all the time. So there's definitely like just nuances in life, and there's definitely contrast in life. And I do get why people suggest other people to really focus on one thing, you know, because you can really put all of your energy into that. But I do think and believe that we need the balance, you know, we need the balance of also just dealing with other things. But yeah, you know, it just tremendously depends on who you are, what you do and all sorts of things. John D. Rockefeller Sr. hired talented people whenever he found them rather than according to need. Confident that Standard Oil's growth would create many spots to fill. He recognized talent even in opponents, which is nothing bad, I guess. Like, I don't know. Like, this is something that I'm seeing in myself as well. Like, I don't know. I see a dude and I think like, well, yeah, you know, he's fucking cool. You know, and he, he's just pumped. And uh, I don't know. I just think that his physique is pretty nice. Or I don't know. I see a girl and I don't know, like she's smarter than me. Well, it is what it is. He recognized talent even in opponents. Parrot put extraordinary effort into evaluating new hires. He devised a 20-page application that asks candidates, among other questions, what they consider the greatest accomplishment of their lives. He met with the wives of the candidates, exploring whether they would tolerate the demands that EDS would put on their husbands. In the early days, a candidate did not get hired before interviewing with every single existing EDS employee, which... I tremendously appreciate and this is also something that shows you how much Parrot is actually also um, appreciating his employees or her employees just because I don't know um, because if you're really like okay I'm not gonna hire this person if he or she is not capable with working um, uh, with another person you know with a, a, another employee of mine this just shows how important your current employees are for you and and I don't know, I mean, it is then also something that's pretty great if you can say like, well, yeah, um, I've been able to just get into this company. I've been able to get into EDS. While Microsoft has attracted aggressively intellectual types uh, characterized as clones of Bill Gates, Sam Walton's top, top aides were typically ambitious small town men like himself. Wayne Husenga's senior managers have tended to be more former, to be former football players with middle class Midwestern backgrounds. Ross Parrott created EDS in his own image by hiring hard charges, hard chargers with military military backgrounds. In recruiting people who shared their views of the world, however, the billionaires did not seek yes men. Confident enough not to feel threatened by strong subordinates, they generally valued aides who were willing to defend opposing points of view, which is, I think, always something that's incredibly important because, yeah, I mean, if you're having somebody that always says yes to whatever you say, then, then yeah, you're not good. Because you talk shit and I talk shit and everyone, everybody talks shit and is wrong sometimes. So yeah. Gates estimates that he devotes 70% of his time to review meetings with small product development teams. The main reason for taking Parrot Systems public in 1999, he says, was to motivate the employees. I want them to know what their work has produced in the way of value. Nothing motivates a team like having them have stock. Well, yeah. This is definitely the case. I mean, if if they have equity in the business, which means that they they have a part of the business, then of course they're going to work harder. You know, they also want to just want their fucking stock to grow. The personal loyalty that Parrot commanded by taking a direct interest in his employees' lives, and there are some points, attract managers with enough self-confidence to challenge your own judgment on matters, delegate authority to detail-oriented executives who can free you to concentrate on a billion dollar ideas, stay close enough to operations to be aware of problems and opportunities, and making sure that your lieutenants follow up on suggestions for improvement, constantly reinforce a focus on controlling costs, use equity incentives to provide your managers and other key employees a realistic change to become uh, millionaires, Show genuine personal concern for people within your organization, which is, I think, something that's incredibly important. And I love that he's pointing that out. Promote moral by maintaining a sense of fun along with seriousness of purpose. All of which I just, I just tremendously believe in all of these things. I just really do. I really, really do from the bottom of my heart. 
it is something that that I would just tell my children. Like, I don't know, be interested in the people, be a good leader, just don't be an asshole, don't just, I don't know. But of course, there has to be some sort of a seriousness, you know, there has to be a degree of that. You know, you can't always be choking around stuff. Um, but yeah. Branson motivates employees to excel by putting them into slightly higher positions than they expect. Like Kirk... Uh, Kirk Corain, Branson has no difficulty delegating day-to-day -day operations, much preferring to spend his time on new ventures. As long as the business is doing well, he does not bother to meet with management while making himself available for a crisis. Which makes sense, I guess. He's only interested in the chase of the deal at the point he feels he has it locked up. He loses interest in... Oh... Uh, at the point he feels he has it locked up, he loses interest in the deals, which is, I think, the same thing with quite a lot of things, like women and... Associates of consumer dealmaker Wayne Husenga describes himself in similar terms. He will have to supplement... You will have to supplement your native talent with acquired skills. To become an outstanding builder of organizations, Wayne Husenga had to correct an early tendency to be courage toward people who did not grasp points he considered self-evident. Intimidated by this reaction, employees would sometimes fail to pass along important information. Ross Parrott and Sam Wharton had to revise their original inclination to reward only senior managers generously, which caused lower-level employees to feel like second-class citizens. This sort of adaptability is one of the most important traits that you should strive to stamp on your organization. Treat people right. This is something that I just want to point out. Happiness lies not in the merge possession of money. It lies in the journey of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort. Franklin D. Roosevelt. And I can't just only fucking sign that. It is just definitely the case. An analysis of the great fortunes founded since the 19th century showed you that they greatly improved their chances by focusing their energies in high growth industries. You then studied the nine fundamental strategies that the self-made billionaires pursued Take monumental risks, do business in a new way, dominate your market, consolidate an industry, buy low, thrive on deals, outmanage the co uh, competition, yes, invest in political influence and resist the unions. Which we've already had those tips, but you know, it's always just great to rehearse and repeat things. The billionaire's story showed you the, showed you the extraordinary power of the following key principles. Pursue the money and ideas. Rules are breakable. Copying pays better than innovating. Keep on growing. Hold on to your equity. Hard work is essential. Keep the back door open. Use financial leverage. Make mistakes and then learn from them. Frugality pays. Enjoy the pursuit and develop a thick skin. A genuinely resolving to become a billionaire means committing yourself wholeheartedly to the goal. It requires a dedication to less intense, no less intense than training to swim the English Channel. Making up your mind to be super rich means subordinate other goals to an all-consuming quest for wealth. You will, not, you will not prosper by performing any activity in a pre- or per-functuary way, regardless of what it has to do with making money. Far from distracting you from the goal of becoming super rich, intensely applying yourself to other aspects of your life will cultivate the habit of excelling. Bill Gates... Intensity extends beyond the workplace. When he was dating Anne Winbland, another pioneer in the computer software industry, the couple chose motives for the brief vacation they could spare the time to take. On a physics-themed vacation, for example, they read as many books on a subject as they could, pack and listen to according, recordings of a lecture series by Richard Feynman, which, uh, or who has written some good books, as far as I remember. Um, to perform like a champion, you also have to outflank thousands of competitors who are perspiring, perspiring every bit as uh, profusely as you are. To avoid being leveled out with the rest of them, you want or you must do something different. You have to contemplate bigger risks, try unorthodox business strategies, or raise the ant in making deals. It is alright to copy someone else's idea, but you have to execute better. Ordinary efforts and conventional approaches do not produce extraordinary wealth and just because it's not producing extraordinary value for the customer and all of these things are just so incredibly important. The question is, I'm 15 minutes in. Well, yeah, I'm gonna just leave it at this or with this or however you say it, I don't know. Because I don't want to stretch this episode because I know that people maybe have to do some other things than listening to my fucking talk. <laughs> Quite, you know, to really be honest. 
Um, but yeah, so I wish you the best health of happiness and all success and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person and then also being remembered as a nice person, which is a really incredibly important thing to think about. And yeah, three other questions that I'm having for you are, why are you here? What are you trying to change and what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea, which is fucking cool. Three other questions that I'm having for you are, oh, one other question that I have for you is the last one. What could you particularly say that is really going to change somebody's life? Because I totally believe that we all could say something that really indeed is going to change somebody's life and it really indeed is going to just make a difference and is going to just make a difference in how people see the world, how people see their lives, how people see themselves. Um, yeah, which is, I think, something that's incredibly important and something that um, that you yourself could also benefit from. I mean being nice feels good and I think it also makes sense from a just nature perspective on that it feels good you know because we're social animals and I don't know you know we kind of were expected to help each other to some degree at least but yeah uh, I'm gonna see you hopefully the next time bye bye and thank you very much I appreciate you please stay healthy and safe and I always hope that your family is safe and healthy and I uh, yeah Thank you.